really want to be going for top marks, then you need to have an appreciation for exactly where your marks are coming from. Um, so just remember that you have two different types of question. Um, you have KAA questions, which just assess your knowledge, application, and analysis skills. And then you have your KAA plus um, evaluation questions. Um, so if you look here, these, these keywords um, you need to be looking out for. So these are going to tell you whether your, your, your question is an evaluation question or a non-evaluation question. So you can see here, um, if your question has the word examine, discuss, evaluate, assess, or um, the phrase to what extent, it's going to be an evaluation question. Um, whereas any questions without these, these keywords in, they're going to be standalone KAA questions. Okay, so the next step in assessing um, the allocation of marks on offer for, for any given question, um, you, you want to be figuring out, okay, how many, how many marks are available for the evaluation component as opposed to the KAA component? So just remember, um, even within the evaluation question, there's still going to be KAA marks on offer. Exactly how many KAA marks on offer depends on um, the total number of of marks um, in this question. So you can see here that for any KAA, um, sorry, for any evaluation questions, the allocation of marks available to KAA is never going to be more than, or it's always going to be less than 50%. So here, if you notice for, a, for an eight mark question, for an eight mark evaluation question, that is, um, you're going to have six KAA marks and two evaluation marks. Uh, for a 10 marker, there's a 6-4 split, and for a 14 marker, there's an 8-6 split. So if you remember back to my previous video, uh, we looked at assessing the evaluation KA split. Uh, and this was um, essentially assessing how many marks are on offer for evaluation, how many marks are on offer for uh, the KEA component for, of, of any of these longer evaluation questions. So if you're looking, um, here are our three um, longer evaluation questions for, for the data question we looked at previously. And here you can see the number of marks available for evaluation as opposed to KAA. Um, if you look at the evaluation marks on offer, you notice these are all multiples of two. Um, the reason for this is that um, essentially any evaluation point that you make, any valid evaluation point that you make, um, there's going to be a minimum of two marks available on offer for each of these. So um, if you take the six mark question, two different ways of approaching this, the, 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 the uh, a question where there's six evaluation marks on offer. Um, first of all, you could go for three less developed evaluation points for two marks each to get your six. Alternatively, you could go for two more developed um, evaluation points for three marks each. That could also get you your six marks. My advice to you would be to make sure that you always go for more rather than less. Okay, if you make three uh, weak evaluation points, actually one of those might turn out to be a stronger evaluation point, um, and that could compensate for um, kind of any any weaknesses in any of your other evaluation points. So I always say um, it's best to be safe and sorry. Make more evaluation points rather than less. <laughs> So you probably recognize that I took the last two chapters from this video from my last LXL exam technique video on um, unit one questions. Um, from this point onwards, this is all new stuff. Okay, so whilst your um, exam technique is directly applicable in terms of the way you're going to approach your evaluation questions, and the number of evaluation points you're going to make, and um, the, exam, the, the KAA evaluation split, um, this is kind of where your similarities end. Um, so in terms of your go-to evaluation points, these do differ ever so slightly from unit one. Um, and I'm going to run you through these now. Um, <clears throat> so the first one we're going to look at is um, spare capacity versus full, em full employment. Um, so if you think back to unit one, we spoke about um, elasticity is what happens when the price elasticity of demand is elastic versus the case where price elasticity of demand is inelastic. And we're going to do quite a similar thing here um, but with your ADAS diagram. So any analysis that you make in terms of changes in price um, level and changes in real output, you're going to say, well, this, this, this would be the case um, if our starting point is, is, is um, full employment, whereas this is going to be the case um, if our um, starting point is, is, is um, the position within the economy where um, there's lots of spare capacity left. Um, so... Uh, it's always going to be the case that if you have a rise or a fall in aggregate demand and you're up on that vertical section of your aggregate supply curve, i.e. the full employment level, then um, your change in, in the price level, your change in inflation is going to be quite uh, dramatic, whereas um, changes in your 
uh, real GDP are going to be very limited and it's going to be the reverse if we're on that horizontal section and the spare capacity section of your aggregate supply curve. Um, so that's spare capacity versus full employment. Next, moving on to uh, magnitude. Okay, so magnitude, um, your teacher might use the word extent or, or just the word kind of size. Um, all you're going to do here is, is look at your analysis and say, well, okay, if we've got a certain policy measure and the effects of this policy measure are going to be um, are going to vary and are going to be dependent on um, the size of the policy measure um, in place. So you might be talking about a reduction in tax or a cut in interest rates. Obviously, the effects of these two uh, policy interventions, they're going to vary depending on the size of that um, spending cut or that uh, base rate cut. Um, so that's magnitude. Next, we're going to look at time period, so our second round effects. So again, time period is something we looked at in unit one. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we transfer this over to, to our macro-based concept, second round effects is something that I want you to bear in mind. Um, so this is particularly the case when we're looking at um, currency movements and, and kind of differences in trade. Um, so if you think, uh, take for example, um, an increase in exports, you know that that's going to shift your aggregate demand curve outwards. Um, real GDP is going to rise, but um, if real GDP re re incomes are rising, that's also going to um, cause imports to rise as a second round effect. So that second round effect is actually going to, um, it's going to cause movements in the exchange rate and it's also going to push our aggregate demand curve back. Uh, so this is the type of evaluation point you want to be making kind of contrast in the short run case where aggregate demand shifts out, it increases as a result of um, kind of export driven growth, but then it's going to go back the other way um, if imports increase. Um, Moving on, size of the multiplier effect. So if we're talking about um, injections into the circular flow, um, in particular government spending, um, <clears throat> you, can, you, can, you can assess this by discussing the size of the multiplier effect. Obviously, if the multiplier effect is, um, is, is large, if the government spending multiplier is large, then you know that um, the effect of government spending on real GDP is going to be quite pronounced, whereas um, if our government spending multiplier is, is, is minimal, then um, any increases to government spending are, are going to have a limited effect on, the, um, on, on real GDP growth. And then finally, potential reactions. So say you're, you're talking about um, monetary policy, or no, let's look at this the other way around. Say you're looking at fiscal policy, and we're saying, okay, um, the, for one reason or another, the government's going to cut back on government spending or increase um, taxation. So here we're talking about contractionary fiscal policy. Um, you know the real GDP is going to fall and depending on which section of the aggregate supply curve we're on, um, the price level is going to fall. In terms of our potential reactions, the type of thing you want to be talking about is um, reactions on the monetary side. So if um, economic growth is stagnating, if um, inflation is falling as a result of this contractionary fiscal policy, um, the central bank may, may intervene and reduce interest rates to stimulate that, the economy. Okay, so that's potential reactions to any, any uh, policy interventions you've already spoken about. Right, so let me run you through Jan 2013, question number one. Um, it's an exam paper that we've already looked at. I've showed you how to pick up the KA marks for each of these the questions on this exam paper, all the way through up to um, C part I. Um, if you haven't looked at that video, I strongly advise that you do so. It should be up on the sidebar now on my left, but your right just there, if YouTube is indexing things correctly. Um, <clears throat> just remember here, everything that pops up in blue on the screen here is going to be um, your KA marks. Everything that pops up in black is going to be um, your evaluation marks. So um, AII is your first evaluation um, question on, on this um, data response section. It's a 12 marker, so it's going to be an 8-4 split. The question reads, um, with the aid of an aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram, assess the likely effects on the UK economy of a reduction in business investment. So we've already said, you know, this feeds directly into your aggregate demand curve. We're going to have aggregate demand shifting um, AD1 to AD2 or AD to AD1, however you've labelled it. But essentially, we've got um, a reduction in aggregate demand um, and it's going to cause real GDP to fall, it's going to cause inflation to um, fall, and it's going to cause unemployment to rise, generally speaking, right? So it's an 8-4 split, so just remember, we need to make two evaluation points here. So we're going for two and two in terms of our evaluation marks. Um, <clears throat> first point you could make is a point on um, 
spare capacity. So this is a very good example of where you've drawn a diagram. You're simply going to assess the case where there's lots of spare capacity left in the economy um, compared to the case where we're at this full employment level here at uh, on the vertical section of our aggregate supply curve. <clears throat> so that's um, spare capacity. Um, next one, magnitude. Um, just running through the numbers here, it says that uh, business investment has not grown. It doesn't really imply that um, there's been a large drop in, in real terms in business investment. It just says that business investment has not grown. So it might just be the case that um, the nominal, nominal value of, of business investment has, has um, stayed the same, but as a result of the, the kind of um, eroding effects of inflation, in, in real terms, um, that real business investment has actually fallen slightly. So um, that's the point I'm making here. And lastly, time period. So we're contrasting the short run effects with the long run effects. Um, <clears throat> and here I'm simply saying that in the long run, um, this these falls in GDP and um, uh, and employment or, or the rise in unemployment could be more pronounced in the long term as opposed to the short term. Because in the long run, we have uh, both this effect, this, this short run effect, um, of, of AD falling. And also, if we're talking about business investment, you know that productivity is going to fall, productive capacity is going to fall, and as a result, aggregate supply is also going to shift to the left, aggregate supply is also going to decrease. Okay, so we've got this kind of compounded effect of aggregate supply falling and aggregate demand falling. So actually, the, the, the fall in macroeconomic performance may be more pronounced than um, in the long term compared to just the short term. <laughs> Right, so BII reads, with reference to figure two, discuss two likely consequences of the output gap from 2009. So just a quick point on this question. And the output gap is not really discussed in sufficient detail in AS level economics. Obviously, if you're a clever boy or girl, um, you go and study economics at university level, uh, but you look at this in um, sufficient depth. Um, but um, when it comes to the, the AS level specification, um, because because it's not really covered in, in enough technical detail, it can be quite difficult to, to answer some questions. Um, that being said, so this question, the 12 mark question, is going to be an 8-4 split. Looking for two evaluation points here. In terms of our KA marks, we've already said, um, because the output gap is negative, remember you're looking at that graph, um, which shows a negative output gap. Um, because the output gap is negative, unemployment, generally speaking, is going to be high. Real GDP is going to be low. Um, in terms of your evaluation points, the first point is going to be um, one on magnitude and time period. Like I said, a lot of the time, your evaluation points are going to overlap with one another. Um, <clears throat> so if you're looking at the graph that they've supplied to you, you can see from 2009 onwards, your output gap is decreasing. So... When it comes to talking about time period, are we in 2009 where the um, output gap is large, sorry, the negative output gap is large, or are we in 2012 where the negative output gap is smaller? So obviously that ties in with magnitude as well. And then your second point is just a point on time period, um, your second evaluation point. And so here um, I'm talking about um, business investment and um, business confidence. What happens when the output gap is is um, negative for a prolonged period of time as opposed to um, kind of the, the short run effects of just um, a temporary um, a temporary kind of slowdown in, in, in real GDP um, for just say say one year or, or a year and a half okay see um, the longer this negative output gap continues then the more of an effect this is going to have on business uh, confidence um, and, the, uh, the, and the less businesses are going to invest in, the, in their own companies and obviously that's going to have an effect on AD and that's going to have a compounding effect on um, real GDP. Okay, now onto the scary one, your 30 mark evaluation question. So you know here, unit two, you don't have that multiple choice um, section of the paper to fall back on, but you have this 30 mark um, essay instead, which is very nice of Excel, um, but nothing to be too worried about. The question here says evaluate the macroeconomic effects of the UK government trying to reduce its budget deficit, assuming economic growth remains weak. Okay, so general structure. Um, you're going to have six KAA marks available. Um, so these, these are your gimme KAA marks, similar to um, when you're approaching your shorter questions, you know you, you go straight away to your diagrams, your definitions, and your references to the extracts. 
Um, so you should pick most of these up implicitly, but my one, one piece of advice to you would be to start off your um, essay with um, an introductory paragraph where you're talking about, so you're giving definitions, so give two definitions of key terms and um, you're, you're bringing in references to the extract. So in this case, it's a question on um, economic growth and a question on, on the budget deficit. So those key words are given to you in the, um, in the question. It makes perfect sense to define both of those. Um, you're going to get marks for that and then make some references to the extra. So that's in your, your first introductory paragraph. That should pick you up, um, or that should sorry, guarantee you that you pick up all six um, KA marks, providing that you've got um, something that resembles um, kind of sensible economics in the rest of your, your essay. Um, and then the rest of your KA marks, so you've got 12 more to pick up. You're going to go for um, three lots of um, four points. So this is, so you're looking for three separate um, kind of explanation points here. So you want to be talking about three different things. Um, so generally speaking, if you look at the way your questions are structured, they either allow you to cycle through different macroeconomic policies or different um, macroeconomic objectives. So a couple of examples of this. Um, if you look at your Jan 2014 paper, the first 30 mark question says, with reference to the information provided and your own knowledge, evaluate the policies that the UK government could adopt to improve productivity. So there you can see that you're just going to cycle through different policies. And so you're looking for, remember we're looking for, for um, three separate um, explanation points here and these are just going to take the form of different policies. So you're looking to pick up four marks for each of these policies in terms of your explanation marks um, to pick up the, the 12 remaining KA marks. Alternatively, the other question on this paper says, um, with reference to the information provided and your own knowledge, to what extent might monetary policy help the UK government achieve its macroeconomic objectives? So here, um, you're talking about different macroeconomic objectives. So you're going to pick out three of them and you're hoping to pick up um, four explanation marks for each of these um, macroeconomic objectives that you talk about in order to pick up your 12 KA marks there. Um, and then lastly, so we, if, you, if you're doing well, you picked up six KA marks um, from your gimme KA marks, so your diagrams, um, definitions, definitions, et cetera. And then you've made three good points for four marks each to pick up your 12 explanation marks. Now, um, looking at our 12 evaluation marks, and on a similar kind of uh, mark allocation to um, your explanation points, so you want to make three good evaluation points for four marks each. Okay, uh, if you just hang on a minute, I will show you um, examples of explanation points and evaluation uh, points that you can make off the back of each of these. So I'm going to run you through a few examples of four mark explanations followed by four mark evaluation points. So just remember, um, you need to be evaluating your explanation points as you go along. So your, your essay should read introduction, uh, explanation followed by evaluation, explanation followed by evaluation, and then the final paragraph, um, explanation followed by evaluation. So remember, you want to be making three, um, three evaluated points for um, essentially eight marks each. So if you're combining your four marks for your um, explanation, your four marks for evaluation, for each of these kind of um, points, you didn't have eight marks on offer. Right, so um, <clears throat> if you remind yourself of the question, evaluate the macroeconomic effects of the UK government trying to reduce its budget deficits, um, assuming economic growth remains weak. So remember these questions, they allow you to cycle through either macroeconomic objectives, macroeconomic um, indicators, or um, different macroeconomic policies. So in this case, we're looking at um, objectives. Um, so you can talk about a whole multitude of things here. Just remember your, your macroeconomic objectives, your indicators, you've got GDP, um, GDP slash growth, inflation, um, unemployment, talking about your budget deficit, talking about your um, trade deficit. So you can talk about any one of these. It doesn't matter which of these you choose in, in answering the question. Um, you just need to pick out three of these and make sure um, you've got something to say about them. Um, so the first one I'm going to look at is um, GDP and unemployment. So remember these these kind of um, 
you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. If real GDP is rising, generally the, the level of economic activity is increasing, then it's fairly safe to say that unemployment is falling. Um, so going back to the question, um, just remember, so here we're talking about a reduction in the budget deficit. So you know that this means that either um, the government spending is going to be falling or taxation is going to be increasing or a combination of both. But you know, um, either way, you're going to have aggregate demand falling. This is going to be a contractionary fiscal policy rather than expansionary fiscal policy. So aggregate demand is going to be shifting to the left. It's going to be decreasing. And this is going to cause real GDP to fall, um, unemployment to rise, inflation to fall, um, depending on which section of the aggregate supply curve we're on. So that's my first evaluation point. My first explanation point is centered around a graph talking about what's going to happen to real GDP and unemployment. My evaluation point is going to be saying, well, okay, very similar to BIII, and we looked at the spare capacity case versus the full employment case. If you're on the vertical section here, then you're, um, as a result of this fall in aggregate demand, we're going to have um, kind of a, a limited effect on real GDP, whereas inflation uh, may fall quite dramatically. Whereas if we're further, um, further to the left along this horizontal section of our aggregate supply curve, there's lots of spare capacity left in the economy, then um, the effect on real GDP is going to be much more pronounced compared to the effect on inflation. So that's my first, um, first evaluation point on um, spare capacity. So the second macroeconomic objective that I'm going to look at here is um, the budget deficit. So you know by definition if the government cuts um, government spending and it increases taxation that the budget deficit is going to improve, it's going to decrease. And if you want to pick up further analysis marks, you can talk about the fact that if the budget deficit goes from a deficit to a surplus, so we're implementing very, very contractionary fiscal policy here, then the government's debt pile is going to decrease and the government's debt payments are going to decrease. So if the government's implementing very aggressive cuts, um, as has been the case with Greece, then um, they will actually improve their fiscal situation in that um, they will have to make fewer debt payments. Um, right, in terms of evaluating this analysis, um, you can simply talk about extent. So, so stating that um, if the government implements uh, quite, quite gentle cuts as opposed to quite severe cuts, then um, the extent to which the, the, the budget deficit falls is going to be quite limited. Um, alternatively, you can also talk about the fact that, almost as a second round effect, if the government's implementing these cuts, it's um, implementing fiscal, um, contractionary fiscal policy, i.e. constraining aggregate demand um, through the use of, um, through the use of, of um, cuts in government spending and rises in taxation, then, you know, aggregate demand is going to fall and real GDP is going to fall as well. If real GDP is falling, real output is falling, then tax receipts are also going to fall. And actually, this is going to cause the uh, budget deficit to worsen. OK, so you've got that almost that second round effect there. The point I'm going to be make is on inflation, but you can also make this evaluation point um, tied to unemployment or, or real GDP also. And basically, um, remember in the first paragraph, we we're saying that... Um, <clears throat> We're saying that if the government implements contractionary fiscal policies, so government spending falling, taxation rising, aggregate demand is going to shift to the left. But just remember, as that's, so that's a short-term effect. We're looking at long-term effects. Um, so if the government isn't spending, isn't, made, isn't spending enough money on capital expenditure in, in addition to current expenditure, then not only is this going to affect aggregate demand, it's going to affect aggregate supply. So capital expenditure is a form of investment in um, in, in the kind of productive capacity of the economy. So we're gonna have aggregate supply shifting to the left, aggregate supply um, decreasing. Um, the productive capacity of the economy is going to shrink. And here from this diagram, you can see that, um, you can see that inflation may, may rise in the long term if um, investment is, is at a very low level for, uh, for, for a prolonged period of time. Um, so just a quick point on this. If you notice, I, I drew a diagram. So this was the case with um, com contrasting the spare capacity case with the, um, the full employment case. You're actually going to pick up two, two um, points for every kind of relevant diagram that you draw. So maybe in this case, um, you, don't want to, you don't want to draw your aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, your initial one showing the aggregate demand shifting to the left. Maybe you don't want to draw that one again, but 
um, drawing a separate diagram where you have aggregate supply shifting to the left as a, as a long-term effect, that will definitely pick you up a further two marks. So my advice to you would be to, um, you do want to shoehorn in as many diagrams as possible. Um, you're going to pick up two marks for every relevant diagram, but try, essentially try not to repeat yourself. <laughs>